1965 Frank Herbert novel Dune and the 1964 Soviet novel Hard to Be a God are in many ways two sides of the same coin. Both novels were published within a year of each other. Both have received three adaptations. One in the 1980s that, while bombastic and flashy, was critically panned. One miniseries made in the early 2000s that has culturally been forgotten. And a very well-regarded modern recent adaptation that relies both on grounded minimalist and experimental maximalist stylistic visuals at the same time. And both stories are science fantasy with minimal technology focusing on a man using insider knowledge to more or less take advantage of a group of religious people who are both underdeveloped and primitive compared to the culture that he comes from to manipulate them for his own goals. But where Dune is a nightmare of a future, where all humanity has managed to do is reform into a feudal system that serves at the feet of an emperor, even after conquering the stars. A world where a single capitalist company called Chome holds all real power and dictates every major decision involving power that is ever made, including holding the very upper echelons of the empire and noble families to its every whim. Hard to be a god is in a way the inverse of everything that Dune stands for, while at the same time has the same basic message of human nature. If Dune is the warning, then hard to be a god is the other way that we could be, at least politically while still like Dune simultaneously expressing an overall critical view of humanity, our social and political structures, our development, and how we as a species depend on religion and the worship of both deities as well as political figures who are sometimes one in the same. The world of Hard to Be a God and its series of 10 novels called The Noon Universe, written by brothers Boris and Arkady Strugatsky, is in theory a technological utopia. Following the global acceptance of communism, the human race has accelerated to the point of mastering space travel. There's an overabundance of resources, and the idea of work no longer exists as we know it today. The World Council government is formed as a cooperation of doctors, artists, historians, scientists, and professors, who all specialize in specific fields of how to further improve the human condition. Where Dune's planetary expansion was in part fallout from a technology war called the Butlerian Jihad, an event that resulted in the desolation of all human knowledge and history, leading to a new dark age, as well as the expansion of power with multiple factions such as the Empire, the Spacing Guild, and the Bene Gesserit all of which work against each other in paranoia for their own self-interest. The world of Hard to Be a God is one of progress and cooperation of all of mankind, not all that unlike Star Trek, which this preceded by several years. But even though it is an image of a utopia does not mean that human nature has changed, and in that, there are still those who deal with inner demons that no amount of progress will ever improve. In the background, working in esoteric and mysterious ways thousands of years ago, are a secret sect known as the Wanderers, who, not unlike Dune's Bene Gesserit, have been operating without notice to sow the seeds of their desires for progress for the galaxy. Those seeds, those human beings, who the Wanderers have been planting naked, toolless, and alone on habitable planets around the galaxy in hopes that they would pull themselves up from the dirt and develop into functioning societies. Small little gardens that they have cultivated across time and space. Earth is merely one of their experimental colonies, and the first to become truly successful both in intergalactic travel as well as forming a system of government that is stable and self-sustaining. There is a profession in this universe that are in ways similar to our real-life CIA that are very controversial within the lore of the story, who are called the Progressors. Their duty is to search the stars, to discover those colonies that were started all those thousands of years ago by the Wanderers, who may or may not have been an order of advanced humans themselves, and bring those colonies into the light, manipulate their governmental systems, teach them how to culturally focus on art and expression, lead uprisings to topple local authoritarians if needed, that have formed in ideologies that are not synchronistic with those views of the World Council place new leaders who do hold their values, and bring these primitive people into what is considered to be the homogenized acceptable behaviors of the galactic human society, and socially acclimate them and mature them at a rapid rate of change. And as you can imagine, this is often a very messy process. 
This is where our story begins, as a team finds a planet that has never left the Middle Ages period, because an unending dynasty of feudal fascism took hold before they could ever have a renaissance. A world that has existed in a perpetual dark age now for hundreds or maybe even thousands of years. They have no history. They have no real culture. Only religious hierarchy and a system that encourages people to suffer in the mud and the rain, endlessly unchanging for the rest of time. People are born and then they die. And yet, the world around them in that is stuck in stasis. But unlike most progressors, this team is made of scientists who are under strict orders to not impact or alter the timeline of these people. Instead, they are to study them, learn their ways, perform research on them on the rate that they discover technology, and conduct anthropological experiments on them before a different team of progressors can come and bring them into the light of modern humanity at a later date after they have been studied. And like Dune, the basic structure of this allegorical world serves to present to us a mirror of its time. Dune, not unlike Lord of the Rings, is in a lot of ways a rumination on World War II and the decades of aftermath following that conflict. Both Herbert and Tolkien served their countries in war, although Tolkien was in World War I. But he did have a great invested interest in two, as essentially any artist of the time did. In Herbert's world of the first novel, you basically have three sects of people. The white-coated protagonists, the white-coated antagonists, and in the middle, a group of minorities that the conflict is largely centered around, as both white sides operate to see who can manipulate them first to their advantage, or kill them before they become too much of a problem. The antagonists of the first novel are very much draped in the imagery and iconography of the Axis powers, and this is not subtle. From the Bene Gesserit's obsession over pure bloodlines and eugenics, the Harkonnens' strict and ruthless determination to uphold their military image, the Emperor's secret army of assassin warriors that operate in the shadows called the Sadukar, they were trained on the planet Seleucia Segundus, literally the SS, down to the very names of a lot of our unapologetically evil and genocidal villains, Vladimir Harkonnen being of Russian origin, Fade Rautha sounding vaguely Germanic, and Dr. Yue being coded to read as Japanese, who is the man who initiates a betrayal sneak attack against the Atreides and brings them into the ongoing conflict. And in this fashion, the Atreides are very much to me intended to be vague stand-ins for America, overtly portraying a sense of being the moralistic voice of the universe, but still in secret being just as ruthless and willing to kill and scheme and operate plans within plans against their enemies, and even against innocent bystanders. Many times in the book, Duke Leto does something good for his people, not because he thinks it to be right, but instead because it is not tremendously inconvenient for him to do so and would make him look better as far as public relations are concerned when compared to the Harkonnens. And this can be shown in their names, which are very American-coded, or at least Anglo-Christian Western-coded. Jessica and Paul are two protagonists, being very boring, common American names. An aspect of the series that I think people often make fun of, but to me is key to communicating the allegory that Herbert seems to be trying to build. <laughs> I mean, one of their right-hand men is named Duncan Idaho. But then, we learn that Lady Jessica and Paul are both secretly of Harkonnen descent, just like white Americans are of Europeans. Their knowledge of this is timed to align with their more desperate and grand displays of propaganda and political violence that they use as a means to get their way in the ongoing conflict. The Atreides and the Harkonnens are one and the same. The only difference between them is how they publicly present themselves and their own actions. Power over spice is power over all, and both are willing to do anything that it takes to the other to maintain that power. And we see this trajectory that Paul takes from noble-born son to warlord prophesized messiah of a group of foreign people, to an extent represented within Hard to Be a God. One of the Earthling scientists who has been sent to this planet, who is our protagonist, reinvents himself as a character of his own creation, the noble lord Don Rumata, who has ruled this city at the favor of the local king and kept order over these people for the past 20 years through supposed divine rites. As it is said that he is born of the god of their local pagan religion, he has taken this role and stretched the boundaries of his job description on this planet to try and stop the intellectuals and free thinkers of this world from being being put to death by the lords upholding the laws of the fascist king, and to try and help this culture progress semi-naturally with minimal invasive action on the behalf of Earth. At night, he dreams of murder, and to pass his days on this hellish planet and their brutal culture, he has developed severe alcoholism and depression, as have most of the artists and scientists that he has saved and sent to a commune hidden out in the swamps. 
and his role within this narrative is one that ties to an important theological question. If there is a god, why does he allow then for there to be such widespread hardships and suffering among his creations or his subjects? On the surface, it seems quite malicious, and maybe to an extent it is, or maybe just outright is. But when looking at it through the dilemma of the progressors and the perspective of Don Rumata, you can make the argument that the situation is not so black and white. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. It paints a god who wants us to do better not because we were made to, but instead because we choose to. Because we work together for good. Suffering exists and evil is allowed to continue because if God were to intervene and show the divine path directly, then we would grow lazy and complicit in his love or guidance. If, you know, you prescribed that kind of worldview. God helps those who helps themselves as they say. Without the sense of drive and exploration that naturally leads to the development within a society of cultural art, of philosophy, of a better, kinder world. There is, as a result, no self-agency, no achievement of doing something for the good of the many. Without old men who plant trees that they themselves will never sit under, then things will never progress to better times. And if those old men do not plant those trees, then does that society deserve progress? In one scene, a revolutionary figure begs Don Ramada to use his secret advanced technology to help lead a slave uprising, but he refuses saying that until the cultural mentality based around cruelty and slavery has changed, until these people decide that slavery is morally wrong on their own, then even if the revolution is successful, they will still be doomed to slowly eventually slip back into slavery. The only thing that would change is the power dynamic of which group is being exploited. He leads merely through inaction, only holding supposed power because he never uses it. One could argue from a certain perspective that nothing has value if it has not been manufactured from work that a lesson cannot be learned without first experiencing pain or a failure, and that if divine power was used to unnaturally fix a social issue, then that social issue's absence would never be appreciated or fully understood. But isn't this similar to modern day people who argue that we shouldn't cancel student debt for young people because it would not be fair because they themselves had to repay that debt when they were younger? The good things never happen because there has to be a blood atonement for the wheels of progress to turn, and that we can't do good just for the sake of good. It's a traditionally liberal, centrist attitude. There's a flawed moral stance in that. And in that, is the godlike role of the progressor scientist ultimately a good or a bad one? When they force a culture into development at an unnaturally fast rate, which will always cause several magnitudes of types of upheaval within a society that will result in many deaths, and only do so when it is convenient for them and not for the people who are being subjugated? Is it forcing a one-sized-fits-all way of life onto a people who will both not appreciate these so-called gifts of development or may not even be suited for them culturally? Instead of listening to the people's needs when they come to tell you directly of the action that is needed for the betterment of their lives in the moments now. In what way are the progressors any different from the white colonialists who destroyed cultures by spreading what they preached as the proper way of life and did so both through incredible acts of violence and also negligible inaction that led to disasters? It is a clear analogy of the problems that exist in the core of the mindset of the white man's burden and the power that can be exploited by those who believe themselves to have the divine right to manage cultures that they deem as lesser because of their level of development or at least claim to have that divine right as an excuse for their actions, which is also at the heart of Paul's dilemma in Dune. But even more than Paul, Don Rumata in this, to me, resembles more Dr. Kynes from the novel, an imperial planetologist who was sent to Arrakis decades ago to study the ecology and culture of the world before inadvertently becoming a key political figure and leader on the planet. When first introduced to Duke Leto and his son Paul within the novel, the Duke only has one thought of him. Kynes has gone native. Even though he doesn't like him, Leto also understands that the key to taming Arrakis is through Kynes' connection to its native people. Both Kynes and Don Ramada, in their own way, are literary riffs on Conrad's Mr. Kurtz, a figure of a great society of wealth and power who comes to a foreign land to eventually exploit those less fortunate, who see their situation as one of a somewhat mutual exchange. Sure, they gain some safety from this lord and fief relationship, some freedoms, but maybe not as many as they lose from their connection to these essentially feudal lords, no matter how benevolent they may seem compared to the alternative, with Kynes to the Harkonnens and Rumada to the king. They are both ultimately still outsiders, seeking power where they have no place. Both Kynes and Ramada have lived on their planets for years. We see at the end of the film that Ramada is now old, 
that he has refused to leave with the other scientists who have gone home long ago. That he just is this thing now that lords over his slaves on a world that he has never managed to better, despite all the power available at his fingertips. And this theme of this burden that weighs on him, that drives him to madness, where all he can dream of is death, and where he spends his waking moments drinking to keep the hells at bay, all culminates when he is found among a mountain of corpses that are the direct result of his inaction, where he tells his fellow scientists that are fleeing the planet, a god can get tired too. Now, to be upfront, I am not as knowledgeable about Russian history in the 1960s as maybe I should be. But even to me, who does not know a lot about this, it is clear that these novels were intended to be, as all great science fiction is, a critique of the realities of the culture that it was written in at the time. And like Arrakis, Arkanar is a planet that the writers use to project political critiques from the real world into a fictional setting. And this idea of a colonialist going to a foreign country to either co-opt its power or its culture was ripe within genre fiction of the time. And I think that's an interesting idea in itself to look at. Ursula Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness explores a very similar setup to both Dune and Hard to Be a God, but uses that to explore themes of gender and sexuality roles. And that's just one example. Ezra Glinter said of their work on Hard to Be a God in the Paris Review, Despite its projection of socialist victory over capitalism, the book isn't propaganda for the Soviet Union, but a set of compassionate stories about characters struggling for scientific and personal fulfillment. As in the Star Trek universe, which the Noon universe somewhat resembles, humanity has survived its internal crisis, but still has discoveries to make and problems to solve. Conflict in the Noon universe takes place between the good and the better, instead of between good and evil forces. Rather than being a stiff work of agate prompt, Noon 22nd Century is a hopeful reminder of why the Soviet promise was so attractive to begin with. Unsurprisingly, the Strugatsky's optimism did not last. In the 1950s, their work was informed by the post-Stalinist thaw, a period of political and cultural openness when it seemed like the socialist dream might still be possible. But as that hope faded, their writing took on darker tones. In 1964, the same year that Leonid Brezhnev displaced Nikita Khrushchev as Soviet leader, reversing most of his reforms, they published Hard to Be a God, a novel replete with themes of terror and political repression. Though the story takes place in the same fictional universe as noon 22nd century, the world it depicts is much more disturbing. A lot of the imagery surrounding the peasant village at times is very much a parody of the realities of later Soviet country life which in the post-war times was prosperous but entered into a period of slow decline and regression. Grueling, miserable, cold, underdeveloped, and desolate. This can be found in a great deal of other works of the Soviet era, and other future Russian works reflecting back on those times. The 1983 Soviet werewolf movie simply titled The Wolf is one of the most visually striking depictions of gothic poverty that I've ever seen in a film. The very first shot, depicting a bird eating the face of a dead horse that lies in the snow on the side of the road, is all that you need to know about the overall tone that they're going for, in regards to the standards of life at the time. And this movie is not dissimilar to that, or to many other works of Soviet cinema about contemporary life outside of the city. In a lot of ways, this is primarily directed to artists, scientists, and creators in general. If we just stick to talking about film, in the Soviet Union, for artists, it was not a friendly place for free speech and opposing ideas until roughly the late 80s near its eventual downfall. There was basically next to zero horror cinema that was allowed to be created at this time, and very little science fiction and fantasy. V is in part famous because it is so good, but also because it is one of the only surviving works of Soviet film horror, which makes it incredibly interesting. Film was, for the longest time in the earliest years of the country, used as a tool to promote the naturalization of socialist realism. And any works that counteracted that goal would either be destroyed, banned, or edited to the point of falling in line with the party line beliefs of the government. And attempting to make any art that was purposefully transgressive was seen as quite dangerous. The film Father and Son resulted in filmmaker Margarita Barskaya being executed soon after in a prison camp. And this is very much reflected in Hard to Be a God. There are bands of secret police that patrol the countryside, finding artists and scientists and destroying their work, because it might promote different thought processes, keeping the fascist status quo and destroying anything that threatens it within the world of the story. A commentary on the nature of trying to create something that holds value to you and your view of the world, while simultaneously existing in a space that holds you in contempt for existing. 
And I think as a whole, this film, book, and story is most interested in the question of human nature itself and how self-imposed systems almost fool us into thinking that we are different than we are. That maybe people are brutal little monsters because they have always been that way. And that maybe those who have the power to do good fail because, in truth, they never could. That time is the destruction that turns young men of dreams into old men of acceptance and inaction. And that we are all prisoners in our way of the walls that have been built around us. When Boris died, the New York Times said of him in their obituary, a prolific writer whose use of genre and science fiction to voice criticisms of Soviet life that would have been unthinkable in other literary forms. Science fiction, fantasy, and horror all operate as a vehicle in all situations for socially acceptable ways to question authority through vaguely veiled metaphor. The most recent adaptation of the novel that was released in 2013 is what many Westerners would know the story from, and it is one of the most unique productions that have ever been made in the past several decades for a number of different reasons. Filming would begin in the fall of 2000, but in truth, pre-production had started years previously. And due to a number of complications, it would take 13 years of hellish production before it would be completed and shown to audiences. And you can feel this in every shot of the film. I think it is the closest that anyone has ever gotten to showing a real actual glimpse into hell. Just a purely rotten movie from its core, and exceptionally uncomfortable and tedious to actually watch. The film is actively antagonistic to the viewer. Conversations that go nowhere. Events that happen seemingly for no reason. A grueling three-hour experience that chugs at a monotonous pace. The film feels almost mad at you for watching it. And through all of this combined, you're given this portal to look into this place that, while visually similar to our own history, is incredibly alien and unknowable. There is nothing else that looks like this. There is nothing else that feels like this. Words fail to describe the experience, and instead it is best explained as a work by simply just looking at what it was trying to achieve. Every detail is impressive. Every spot of grime and dirt perfectly placed, impeccably designed within an inch of its filth-strewn life. To give the world and the way that these people speak such an otherworldly feeling, filmmaker Alexei German decided not to record any audio on set, and instead decided to record and compose all of the audio in the post-production editing process, a task that would take him years to complete. German himself was an important figure within the Soviet film industry, and transitioned into working on this project after the fall. His own 1971 film, Trial on the Road, had been selected by the government for being too critical of Soviet ideals, and was banned for 15 years. Когда пришел Горбачев и нам разрешили, ну, казалось, это все так глупо, все так будет сейчас хорошо. Вот. А здесь такая случилась, э, как бы тебе сказать, история, что это опять все стало абсолютно... His other films that he made in the 60s and 70s, The Seventh Companion and 20 Days Without War, were also similarly critical about aspects of modern Russian life, but did not cross into a line of having to be censored or outright banned. Alexei German would sadly pass away in February of 2013, while still trying to edit the film and would leave the project incomplete. His son and his wife stepped in and oversaw what work had to be done to get the project in as good a shape as it could be, and it premiered in November of that year. He never got to see his masterpiece be described as being amongst the best of the decade by critics from around the world. From beginning to end, he worked on the film for at least the last 15 years of his life.